A very warm good evening to all the dignitaries, globally recognized IEEE representatives, XCOM members of various regions and subsections, principals of various colleges, organizing committees of this event, branch counselors and student volunteers. I am Manvita Vibharadwaj, student, GSSS Institute of Engineering and Technology for Women, Mysuru, Department of ECE. Welcome you all to the 34th webinar on the path towards 6G, organized by IEEE Information Theory Society Bangalore chapter in association with IEEE Bangalore section and IEEE Mysuru subsection. The topic chosen is highly relevant in the current scenario. I request all the participants to stay muted for the smooth conduction of the event. Let me start the event by briefing you about IEEE. Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers is the world's largest technical professional organization dedicated to advancing technology for the benefit of humanity. IEEE and its members inspire a global community to innovate for a better tomorrow through highly cited publications, conferences, technology, technology standards, and professional or educational activities. IEEE is the trusted voice for engineering, computing, and technological information around the globe. IEEE Information Theory Society membership enables an individual to stay updated within a chosen technology and ensures one in touch with peers. IEEE Information Theory Society is a leading technical society that focuses on the processing, transmission, storage, and use of information, as well as the foundation of the communication process. I now request IEEE Bangalore section ITS chapter, Dr. Parameshachari BD, Professor and Head, Department of TCE, GSSS Institute of Engineering and Technology, for women, Mysuru, to address the IEEE Bangalore section, ITS chapter. Over to you, sir. I think um, uh, uh, Manvita, he is actually uh, right now not with us, so we can skip this part. Directly, you can hand over to uh, Dr. Sridhar for the speaker introduction. Okay, sir. Uh, all right. Uh, so I will go ahead and uh, introduce our speaker for the day. Uh, I'm uh, very pleased to introduce uh, Professor Merwan Dabba, who is uh, Chief uh, Researcher at the Technology Innovation Institute in Abu Dhabi. Uh, he is also an adjunct professor with the Department of Machine Learning at the Mohammed bin Zayed University of Artificial Intelligence. Um, he's had multiple awards and uh, uh, as I said at the beginning, I'll just keep it short so that uh, we can hear more from uh, Professor Dabba. So you can always visit his webpage and uh, see more of uh, what he has achieved thus far. So I hand over the session to you, Professor Dabba. Very good. You see my slides? Yeah, it's visible. Okay, very good. So thank you again for the invitation and, and I'm happy that you could you know um, settle everything on a short notice. So my talk is gonna be about the path towards 6G. Why? Because of course the path is still not totally explained. And here I wanna give you an insight on what's going on at the moment within basically the development of 6G, but also where we are in terms of, of uh, already what we call 5.5G. And so uh, as far as I'm concerned, I've been involved in basically the era of, uh, let's say, 4G with small cells. I've been also one of the main contributors in the technology called Massive MIMO for 5G. And now, and now these, la these recent years, I've been, of course, working at the intersection of AI, but also all this hype around what we call large intelligent surfaces that for which you had, a, uh, from what I understood a talk, quite recently from one of my ex-colleagues uh, called Jordan. So maybe two or three slides of introduction. So I belong to an institute called the Technology Innovation Institute, which is basically an applied research center. By, my, by applied here, what I mean is that we do mostly, all the researchers are doing R&D. They don't do any teaching. And basically they are all basically working on use cases. And these use cases can be either business-driven use cases, meaning they come from external stakeholder or technology-driven use cases. In this case, of course, uh, 6G is an example. There's no business per se immediately, but we invent the future and then we try also to find some businesses around that. The main reason why um, TII was set up, today we're roughly around 530 people. 
was mainly to contribute to this transformation that Abu Dhabi is going on today within what we call a transformation from what, mostly what we call an oil-based economy towards a knowledge-based economy. To be more specific, what we do is, of course, our goal is to position Abu Dhabi as a world-leading R&D hub. And today, there's a lot of investments which are done at the R&D level at, in Abu Dhabi. The second, of course, is to attract, thanks to the, our presence, more and more, I would say, stronger R&D ecosystems to work basically on the major problems that we think are very important. The third one is also, of course, to wrap up in terms of talents, and this is extremely important in the field where we are. And as I told you again, we want to contribute to the knowledge economy, where basically the goal is to go out from the classical, I would say, oil-based system. And finally, of course, we're trying to work, and this, this is uh, at the heart of, as you know, R&D and research, to try to work with all the best people around the world, irrespective of their region, irrespective of the geopolitics which is happening right now, especially in the case of telecommunication, and trying to work also, most importantly, with the best to basically push the frontier of knowledge in the world uh, that we have today. And so, of course, uh, this has been done within what we call priority sectors. We have at the moment in TII 10 centers. Each one has a rough estimate of becoming a center of 100 people. So it's quite a lot with the goal of TII being within the next two years, uh, 1,000 people, which will make it uh, the biggest applied research center in the Middle East. And as you can see, the themes which concern TII today goes from advanced materials to autonomous robotics, cryptography, digital science, directed energy, secure systems, quantum, alternative and renewable energy, biotech and propulsion. The AI part is within the digital science. In fact, in digital science, we have three portfolios. One is related to AI, the other is related to telecommunication. And the last one is related to a very important topic also, which is called cybersecurity. Of course, uh, if you're more interested to have more information, you can always go to our website, uh, tii.ae, and in which basically you can find at the same time the kind of work that we're doing already now. We built, for example, the first quantum computer a couple of months ago. My team in the AI unit built basically the biggest NLP model in Arabic with more than 10 billion parameters, which was a big breakthrough in the discipline at the moment, and is working on more and more types of what we call large language models, if you're interested around that. We're also working, of course, on the topic of 6G, and this is what I'm going to be talking about right now. So let's start a bit of, about basically the evolution of communication in the last couple of years. I think you're all familiar with the evolution towards what we call generations, which are mostly, of course, defined by what we call KPIs, meaning you define some kind of requirements, and based on that, you have technologies which come in. But roughly, if we could summarize, uh, 2G was mostly something which was uh, considered for mobile for voice, meaning being able to provide voice with mobility. There were systems, of course, like DECT, which did not provide that mobility, but that was basically one of the main issues, and that was uh, the big trend in the 90s. Around 2000, uh, we started to look at what we call mobile for data, and 3G was at the heart of this big era in providing mobile for data. 4G came in around 2010, trying to provide what we call mobile for internet. I think here it's very important to understand also that we were so focused in 4G providing mobile for internet that voice was a big issue. You have to know that in 4G, uh, voice is not a technology, but it's an application. And when I mean by application, it means basically that the quality of voice that you have in a 4G system is worse than 2G. So we had to wrap up and fix the issue. At the beginning, to fix the issue, the way we did it is to do a system called CS fallback, secret switch fallback, meaning that whenever you browse on internet, that's okay, you do it on 4G, but whenever you want to make a call, you go on a 2G or 3G network. And a big majority of networks until the last two years were working like that. And it turned out that after the will of shutting down a lot of the 2G and 3G network, we had a lot of pressure for operators to start providing a better quality with what we call voice over LT. And interestingly, I mean, I would not have time to talk today about it. We worked it out. And one of the techniques that we used is what we call AI based voice over LT. And so AI was able to improve basically the quality of voice over LT. And this is the kind of things which is deployed now in uh, the majority of the networks that we have in the world. 5G came in, coming from mobile for internet around 2000 and providing roughly what we call mobile for things, okay? And now we're gonna talk about 6G and what we wanna do here about 6G. Again, I give you a rough idea of what these generation, if you're not in the telecommunication domain, can bring you. 
Now, of course, for each generation in general, the KPIs are much stronger in, the, in terms of the, the definition, and they are related to uplink, downlink rates, and other things like that. And more specifically, you need also to, some sense, in some sense, differentiate the generation from a technology. It can happen that for a given generation for which you have defined some KPIs, there are several technologies which fulfills those KPIs. A typical example, 4G. In the case of 4G, the key technology for 4G is called LTE, but LTE is not the only technology which fulfill the requirements basically related to 4G. For example, WiMAX is another one. For 3G, I can also tell you the same thing. For 2G, I can tell you also the same thing. There's GSM, but there's IS95, and you go on like that. So it's very important to understand that you can have several technologies which respond to a given KPI. Another point also that you need to know is that in general, and I, don't, I will not spend a lot of time on that, uh, one, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G are in general what we call marketing terms. For 5G, the terminology of, the, of, of this generation is called IMT 2020. Why I'm saying this is because you may have in many cases networks which are deployed, which are stamped 5G, but they have nothing to do with 5G. It's just because the guys have been improving basically the network with some performance indicator which are close to 5G, but based on 4G. For example, that happened already in 4G. There were claims already by Sprint in the year 2010 of deployments of 4G, whereas it was only like a 3G enhanced system that they built because they were able to achieve those rates. And I think it's very important also for you because we're talking here with, I would say, more engineering uh, a kind of, of audience or research kind of audience that you uh, make the difference between the marketing term which is these Gs, with respect be, to basically what uh, is the terminal terminology which is used either in 3GBP or in ITU. And here I give you a very specific example that I told you 5G is mobile for things. But however, you would be stamped as a 5G if you basically can respond to these kind of requirements, on which you have very specific kind of definition in terms of what is the downlink rate? What is the uplink rate? And here you see it's around 20 gigabits in the downlink and, and uh, 10 gigabits in the uplink. There's some discrepancy. I could spend hours in explaining why we do that. For example, in the downlink and uplink rate, the discrepancy is evident. In general, the power that you have on a base station is much higher for the same bandwidth than you have from a mobile to the base station. So in general, naturally, you will have some kind of discrepancy between the uplink and downlink rate in any case because of the powers which are different. Also the number of antennas that you can put in a device makes it that in the downlink, you can do a lot of beam forming with the number of a massive MIMO case. Whereas on a mobile, as you all know, you would go to two to four antennas. So these discrepancies happen and these of course translate also to the kind of quality of service, which we have at the moment. And for which of course, some of the customers we have in the world complain because today you are as much downloading that you are, in, that you are uploading. And as you see, there are so many requirements, the community decided that, well, what we're gonna do is gonna try to clusterize the requirements into three things. And this is the classical kind of definition that people tell you for 5G. 5G is about three things, providing you the mobile broadband experience that you would have basically in a classical uh, uh, 4G scenario, providing you new, two new features, which is called ultra reliable low latency communication. Another one, which is related to what we call the massive machine type communication which is basically the things that we're talking about. Said that, it's very important for you to notice that today in the majority of deployment that we have, uh, we're deploying mostly what we call the EMBB scenario. Very few operators are deploying basically URL CMMTC, which is basically, I would say, the highlight of the 5G. This is why when you go outside in general in the deployments, you don't see a big difference of experience with 4G except on the rate, but you say there's not so much new things. It's because the new things are coming now, and they're coming now because the deployments that the operators have been doing is mostly what we call a non-standalone 5G. What I mean by non-standalone 5G it means basically that they keep the core network over 4G and they only change basically the base stations and the spectrum which is used. If you want to deploy URLC or MMTC, for example, for latency, then you need to change the core. Why? Because to be able to achieve those targets that we we're talking about here, you can see it around millisecond type of latency. Then there's many, let's say, kind of features that you have 
in your network, they need to be moved on the edge because, of course, the time response requires that you don't have time to go all the way up inside your network. And I think this is very important to understand that uh, as of today, the majority of network are deploying what we call non-standalone 5G for which we can only provide the MBB scenario. And the reasons why we did this is because basically the kind of market that we saw at the beginning was mostly around what we call the mobile broadband experience. We didn't see too much at the moment the need to deploy URLC of MTC because basically the industry is only coming now with autonomous cars, with all this massive connectivity and also the business cases, how you can make money out of connectivity, how you can make money of latency, were still not clear and now they're being a bit clarified. Here you have a more detailed basically thing that I was saying. If you look at what we call the release 15, and this is the majority of deployments that you have in the world, they're only deploying EMBB. And they're only deploying it in a non-standalone, what we call NSA, and not in a standalone. However, if you want to have all the features that we're talking about, then you need to have an operator which deploys what we call the release 16, which, which of course costs you more, at least for the operator, because he needs to change the core of the network, but then provides you all these features. And of course, all these things translate to, of course, some breakthrough technologies, which have been at the heart of making 5G happen. And this goes from using a bit of higher frequencies than we used to do. This is called the C-band and also millimeter wave. Second is also developing a new radio interface with a lot of features relating to something new called polar codes. An extensive push of a technology called massive MIMO to its limit. Okay, and the kind of limits we can spend time around that, and also basically the devices which are able to handle basically a large feature basically of frequencies. And I think these are very important kind of, of new features which have, of course, enabled uh, the promise that everybody was looking for related to 5G. Now, the story is not finished. I was talking about the path towards 6G, but already now we're seeing already in the standardization process in the releases after 16, the will to go to something called 5.5G. The target of 6G, we'll talk about it, is mostly a target of 2030. From now until 2030, researchers, and especially the guys who are working in standardization, are not going to do nothing. They're going to try to improve the system. And improving the system is very important because basically we have developed the system but not pushed the system to its limit. And it's very important for us to understand what is the limit on which we can push the system before starting a new technology. And here again, you see the kind of problems that we have identified at the beginning when we deployed 5G. The first thing, you remember this imbalances that we're talking about the uplink downing. And one of the big questions is that we have, of course, scenarios where we want to have a massive machine type communication with a high data rate. The majority of people have developed the deployed massive machine type communication are more interested in Twitter-like kind of uh, transmissions. However, with the massive deployment of cameras that we're seeing, we have a lot of cameras, so a lot of things which are there, which are also streaming a lot of data in the uplink and for which basically we don't know how to solve this issue here. And This is becoming a big thing. Second is also trying to solve the fact that we want to have high data rate, but also high reliability, okay? And this is extremely important because basically there are some cases, especially for XR and holographic communication, from which you need both. And in general, you have to know that they don't get they don't go hand in hand. What I mean by that is that if you want to have uh, high reliability, then a communication engineer will tell you that you need to add redundancy. You need to resend the packet. Uh, this is called diversity in two different, I would say, time slots in two different bands, in two different antennas. But this in general reduces your rate. So having at the same time extremely high rate and extremely reliability in general are not compatible, and you're working in what we call a certain region that you have to achieve, and this is the kind of things that people are trying to push. And the last one, of course, is the ability, of course, to be able to do uh, the combination of MMTC and RLC by doing what we call harmonized communication sensing. And as you know, as of today, one of the big markets that we're seeing is what we call LIDARs, and for which now there's a will, of course, to be able to sense the environment with the classical type of communication that we're seeing. I insisted on this slide because I think it's very important to understand that before going to the 6G scenario, there's already a lot of work 
that is being done by top universities, top companies trying to solve basically what I call here the move from a triangle to an hexagonal, on which basically we have some corner points that we need to solve. Now, of course, in terms of frequency bands, it, there's also a lot of issues. And I've been before just the talk of, um, I mean, interacting uh, uh, with you. And one of the, re the, the big issues that we have is the millimeter wave band. On the C band, basically, that uh, has been deployed, we're mostly having a harmonized kind of band around what we call the 3.4 to, to uh, 3.8 gigahertz. That makes 400 megahertz a band. By the way, this is very important for you to understand that when we define the kind of 5G that uh, was defined within the standardization process, we're talking about the peak scenarios. In general, you're very far from getting that in a real network. Not necessarily only because basically uh, uh, you're not in the best conditions, but also because it depends also how operators are deploying the network. I'll give you an example. If you decide to deploy, depending in India, for example, the 5G on the C band, and if you have four operators in India, then you need to divide roughly those four bands, the, the, those 400 megahertz between the four operators. That leaves you only basically 100 megahertz per operator. In the peak scenario that we're talking about 20 gigabits, they were studied when an operator would get the 400 megahertz. So this is also one of the reasons, depending on the country where you go, while you have different experiences of 5G, they will be linked, of course, to your true deployment, which is like the physical base station deployment, but also the kind of spectrum that has been allocated. And the spectrum that has been allocated is also related to the number of operators that you have physically in a country and for which, of course, you need to divide those, those bands and not becoming a network in the speak rate region that I'm talking about. Second is also basically the millimeter, the, the millimeter wave band. On the millimeter wave band, we were quite upset in the sense that, first of all, oh, we had some issues of alignment and you can see him, you can see them here, depending on the countries and the region. But mostly also, the biggest success of millimeter wave in 5G was related to what we call fixed access. OK, uh, fiber to the home or fiber wireless access, and for which basically we we'll provide a WiMAX version. The context of mobile movement to wave is still an issue today. And the main reason is what we call beam alignment. And because if you're mobile, then you move and then the beam needs to always try to track you. And the kind of tracking algorithms that we have today, unfortunately, are not up to basically the quality that we experience. So this is a big issue. Work is continuing to, I mean, researchers, companies are continuously trying to work on that. And which makes also the fact that mobile millimeter wave, which was something that was dreamt, that was, that for which people was, were dreaming about, for 5G may be something that will happen mostly, or more probably in 6G. So this is an issue I think also, which is very important for you. Now, of course, uh, today in terms of 5G, we're only scratching the surface. What I mean by that, there's a huge potential. And I told you today what we're deploying is mostly the EMBB scenario, which is mostly focused to the ICT industry. Whereas we know that the big share of 5G is when what we call the verticals. And these are happening now, and they are now within Pox and trials, exploiting the potential of the two other features of 5G, which are related to what we call ultra-reliable ultra low latency communication and also basically the massive machine type communication. Give you a very example, finance. We're talking with a lot of banks today and a lot of banks today want basically to move basically their telecommunication infrastructure in 5G. Why? Because they got very attracted by the latency features that were starting to sell them. And as you know, in finance, every millisecond that you can gain is a big issue in terms of high frequency trading. So if you can ensure an extreme reliability by doing a high frequency trading basically kind of platform with basically uh, 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 the, the kind of latency of one millisecond, then you get a competitive advantage with respect to the others. And the banks have been for many years by doing very specific deployment, trying to solve those issues. And here they have this platform which is going on. And of course, I can talk to you hours around transport retail because we spend time talking to all these verticals and trying to look at the best use cases on how 5G could bring an added band. Now let's go to the purpose of my talk. 
I did that introduction, which was a bit long for a simple reason, because I wanted all of you to get a bit of a sense of where we are at the moment. And as you saw, uh, at the moment, things are moving. Not all the countries have been deploying what they should deploy. Not all the countries are doing the business development as they should have. And whereas we're already getting a standardization process going on for 5.5G. However, work is already starting for 6G. Why work is starting for 6G? Because even though 2030 is a long way ahead, the kind of technologies that we have to build will be before 2024. You see it here. If you look at down the line before, it's 2024. Uh, this was the this is a, the, the 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 roadmap which has been a consensus with different companies like Huawei and Ericsson and others. And for which basically you see that the kind of, of of technology has to be settled by 2024 because the process of standardization is very long. You have then what we call the study items where people start studying the different technologies and then doing the spec before doing going on into this stuff. So what it means, it means that for all the academics here or chart around my talk here, well, you have a window of two years, two years and a half now to be very innovative. After you cannot do that much for 6G because you cannot go to the pipeline because it takes a lot of time to study all the, the proposals that you're doing and moving on. So roughly what it means, it means that it's the right time to start a PhD and having it finished within the next three years, so you get your ID ramped up basically in 6G. So this is also a call for all the, I would say, innovative people who want to work on this on this on this objective because you are at the right time frame to be able to push your ID. Now, why do you need 6G? That's another question, also. We don't really know. And as you know, it's always a chicken and eggs problem. If uh, some of you were within uh, the year 2000, we were already questioning why we should have 3G. Many people were asking, why do you need basically 3G? And the main reason that people were asking is that nobody's going to read any kind of device while he's moving. Wi Fi is going to be good enough. Why would you need? handovers and roaming while you read basically you cannot walk and read that's not possible and that's the kind of of, of i would say kind of, of of complaints that were done already at the start of 2000 by telling the people we're going to do data with mobility people would say if you want to download data then you sit somewhere and you download why would you download while you move then we found a lot of applications where in fact there's a big need of mobility with data or internet which changed the whole system and here we're on the same road. However, we have already some perception of where things are going. The first one is what we call the extremely immersive experience. And for which basically the kind of data rate that we have in 5G is not enough. The second is the haptic, for which you are all see started stuff, but we're not up to it. Sensing and imaging is extremely important for us. And the fact that we're high and going in higher frequencies, we want to be able to see the environment with the waves and basically positioning is extremely important. Industry 4.0 with connected intelligence. We have been basically mostly what well, we have been connecting basically things together, but not humans with the objects. The smart urban life. The 3D full coverage of the earth is also be getting momentum. And even in the discussions that we're having in the evolution of the networks of 5G, there's all the work around integration of satellite with, I would say, more cell networks, but it's still totally open on how we will solve that thing. Native AI with communication. And last one, which we know is, of course, the fact that the kind of 5G that we have, that have deployed so far is still providing some questions to the people in terms of, is it sustainable? Okay. Now, you have here basically a consensus also, although there has not been still an agreement on the KPIs, but the different consortium around the world on which we have all participated, have roughly agreed on these KPIs, meaning if you solve these KPIs, then you will be stamped within what we call a 6G. And here you can have them. One of the big highlights is to have one terabit wireless. The positioning has become extremely important with 50 centimeter outdoor and one centimeter indoor. And then basically the kind of density of connected device is also there. And so you see that uh, we're pushing basically much farther what we had with respect to 5G. And this is, of course, a big issue on what are today the availability of the technologies to solve this when you know that we only have two years and a half to three years to solve those issues. 
So what I'm going to do in the next slide is give you a hint of the promises that we think uh, can be fulfilled, and especially what are the core technologies that have a big chance to solve the KPIs that we're talking about. And for that, I'm going to cut my talk into three points. One is about around the sensing capability. We're talking about localization and stuff like that. The fact that connectivity, we can increase it, and that will be using new types of materials and using physics paradigm. And the last one is, of course, also the potential that we've seen today of AI to bring, of course, much more uh, potential to the communication that we're doing. On the sensing part, if we start with that, well, let's say that what you want to do is have a better perception of your environment. Waves until now have been mostly used to transmit bits. Since a couple of years, everybody's jumping on the field of using wireless for doing something else. Wireless for recharging, wireless for uh, radars, re wireless for something else. And indeed, there is a potential today to use wireless as something else, and of course, improving your performance in terms of, ex of experience. Before, it was mostly used with imaging, but of course, the fact that we're going in higher frequencies provides us a lot of potential. And if you're in the physics domain, you know that the higher you go in frequency, the better you can discriminate objects within basically what we call a wavelength. And this is very important for us. Now, the kind of sensing that we're seeing goes in three parts. It could be at the terminal level. And today, the work is being done using basically techniques based on LIDAR or radar to be able to detect objects hidden behind walls and whatever. Infrastructure sensing, where we try to do what we call some kind of 3D reconstruction of your environment. This has become very important because today, the waves being able to reconstruct your environment, this information can, take, can be taken at the base station to do more accurate beam forming because you know the texture of your building, things like that, and you can improve on how you can do these things. And this can happen today, of course, because of the combination of frequency that we're using. And of course, the kind of analytics that is being used behind to classify basically the kind of object that we're doing. This goes also to not only basically going into different, I would say, features of the network, but also going into layers of the network. We have what we call sensing at the fee layer, but also sensing at the network layer. And you, you've been seeing papers here and there trying basically to combine and showcasing the potential of both directions. And again, I told you that this is possible today and it's becoming a hype because of the fact that today we have, of course, the capability of going to higher frequencies and we're moving into higher frequencies more and more. The kind of, of course, of signal processing that you need to do is still open. Today, you have two kinds of researchers. You have researchers who think that to go into higher frequencies, you need to improve the RF techniques that we have, amplifiers, whatever you want, in trying to make them work at the extreme up to whatever frequency you have. Others are saying no. Since we're going in higher frequencies, we're going more and more and more in the domain of optics. And what we should do is take basically the techniques of optics, which are quite known, and trying to move them into the RF domain. So it depends on which basically school you are in, in terms of handling it. And then of course you have what we call optical ADCs, things like that, in which Photonics now is coming to the people who used to do what we call DSP. So, of course, who's going to win is still not clear because any one of these techniques, of course, have advantages and caveats in terms of consumption, processing, cost. But this is the kind of trend that we're seeing is a lot of researchers trying to borrow techniques from the photonics to bring them down to RF. A lot of people of RF trying to improve the systems of RF and trying to push them more and more higher into the optics, uh, to the photonics domain. Second thing I want to talk about is, of course, the fact that machine learning and AI techniques are bringing a lot of added value in the way we do. I think you're all familiar with these three guys, which are quite known. Uh, they are like superstars today whenever they give talks, uh, and they are at the heart of the revolution of what we call deep neural network. To understand rapidly the importance, I'm going to give you an example, and I'm trying to go a bit fast on it so that I don't delay. It's quite magic in itself, but you need to understand the caveats. Why it's magic? So suppose you want to do what we call here a ballistic kick. You want to kick a ball. So you have two ways to kick the ball. One way to kick the ball is that you have a knowledge of a, of a theorem, 
okay, or a model. And that kind of law is called Newton. And then you solve the equation and you're able to find the angle theta with which you need to kick the ball for a given angle. Suppose now you're in a situation and we have lots of these cases in telecom where you have no clue basically on how things work. For example, end-to-end -end performance of a system is typically one. In general, you have a very good understanding of the SNR, the physical layer, but then you don't have a good understanding of everything because there are protocols like IPSEC protocols which are handling. And if you try to move and improve something, it doesn't go in the hand in, in the right hand with the others. So in general, in the end-to-end -end perspective, when you're trying to improve or you're trying to improve not quality of service, but quality of experience, you don't have a model. And other things like that that happen in the net. But of course, here you have a potential. So let me give you an example here. So in the case where you don't know Newton, what should you do? Then what you do, and this is obvious, you kick like hell the ball. You kick many times the ball, and this is what we call a data-driven approach. You kick the ball many times, and you, and you have in two columns, distance, angle, distance, angle, distance, angle, distance, angle. Clear? And next time you are asked to get, kick at get a given distance, you'll go in the table, you do what we call lookup table, and you'll try to find the angle. This is called data mining. Where there is a sense of intelligence is when the distance is not in the table, okay? And if the distance is not in the table, what would you do is basically do some kind of regression, okay? What it means regression, meaning you'll do some means. And by doing a mean in the distance domain, you'll find what is the mean you need to do in the angle domain, okay? And so, in fact, it's quite magic because without knowing Newton, if I give you a certain distance, you can know how to do it. And in fact, basically, this is what we call function approximation. And people have developed even the software for doing that. You don't need to be good in maths. You need to train a black box with a lot of data where it's distance, a lot of data which is angle. And next time you have a given distance, the black box will give you the answer. So in fact, if I want to do beamforming, for example, this is a very good example. I don't need to understand anymore how, what's the frequency. I don't need to understand what, is, what, what we call an MMSE uh, 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 kind of, 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 of pre-coder. I don't need to understand. For every distance I beam, okay? And next time there's a new distance which is happening, then basically what I do, well, I interpolate and find the right beam for that, dist for that uh, kind of positioning. And this work, by the way, it's called AI-based massive MIMO beamforming. It's quite magic. Now it's quite magic, but uh, you need to understand that there are some caveats. The first caveat, of course, is I went too fast. I told you that there was a one-to-one -one mapping between distance and angle. In fact, it's wrong. You need to know also what we call the initial speed in your system. And in general, we have a hard time understanding what is basically the input output parameters of your, of your system. Second thing also is when you did your data-driven approaches, you trained your system. Well, basically you need to train your system in every type of configuration. For example, in the AI-based massive MIMO beamforming example that I've given you, you would do it in a city and then your base station is trained, but then you need to retrain everything when you are basically in a region where you are mostly rural area and you need to do this every time. So here, for example, if you have trained your system to kick the ball when it was sunny without any wind, the day you're asked to kick the ball when it's windy, all the parameters are screwed up, it doesn't work. Of course, people are working on techniques like transfer learning to try to solve it, but I don't have time to talk about it. But of course, you can still build solved, but you have this problem that it has a cost and you need to train your system for every new configuration that you have. The last one, of course, is the question of basically unknown. When you have trained basically your kick exactly on Earth, you have no clue on how to train basically your system on the moon. And this is, of course, because you are not able to generalize. So I would not have to, time to talk about it. It's just because the techniques that we're doing today are mostly based, it's not a question of AI, but it's mostly based on the fact that we use deep neural networks, which are what we call function approximators. And basically on these things, you'll never be able to discover gravity out of your data. However, we know that one way to solve this problem is to find, let's say, machine learning techniques, which are able to exploit what we call invariance in your data. I mean, what I mean by invariance, it means that you're kind of, there's something that does not change in your data by translation, rotation, any kind of what we call some kind of, of transformation or geometrical transformation. But this is still at the level of research and I don't have time to talk about it, but I think it's quite, it's quite important for you to understand those things. 
Second thing also, which is uh, very good at the moment, is of course also that the kind of computing that we're having today has also moved from the cloud to the edge. This is another type of paradigm, which is also having a huge impact in our communication system. And we realized quite recently that basically there's no reason, and it's over flooding our network, that every time the data is brought out to basically the cloud to take a decision on whatever in your network. You could do a system where basically the data still stays at the level of your device, but on which basically it's not anymore the data that moves basically within your network, but it's the models or what you have computed. In the computer science domain, you have to know that there's a similar trend. In the computer science domain, people who have done computers, they know that there's a big loss in your network if you decide to move your data where the computing is. Okay, and this is based on the fact that uh, we've been using what we call classical von Neumann architectures. This is how the computer were done. And on which basically moving the data towards where the computing unit is has a big loss because of, of course, the loss of, of, of the delay. It's much better basically to move the computing where the data is. And this is the kind of tendency that we're seeing today because we're seeing more and more the will that things are not moved anymore. And basically we compute whatever we can extract and we move the computing over the network. So people are working in semantic communication. Others are part of that discipline on which you're not moving anymore the data as you, you, you used to. You're moving the common understanding between people or basically the model that you have learned. And of course, for 6G, this poses you new, uh, I would say, opportunities. Because the big question that we're asking today is that since we know that AI is going to be pervasive because of this big trend of, 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 of the industry, and for which we'll have a large scale distributed architecture or network. What is the right network that permits to connect everything? How we can connect AI thanks to that? We're not interested anymore basically to connect people and objects, but we're interested to connect basically intelligence together. And by doing that, of course, this changes the paradigm because your network is not, the intention is not anymore to move the data. It's really about moving the computing from one point to the other point. How we do it is still unknown. Many people are working within the 6G scenario to try to come up with what we call a unifying training and inference network, trying, of course, to cope and finding the right kind of signaling format. Because remember, at the end, you're not going to standardize AI. You're going to standardize the interfaces. Interfaces. You don't standardize AI. And by standardizing the interfaces, you're also going to standardize the signaling format on which basically this kind of computing will move so that you can leverage basically collective intelligence from massive number of individual intelligence in this case. Of course, today, the way it's done, I would say is very rudimentary. The way people are seeing the network in 6G, they're just saying, okay, you see it here, it's mostly centralized AI. You have basically uh, devices which bring things to the AI and then it becomes the AI cloud. And what we're going to do? Well, we're going to we're going to standardize basically the interfaces by saying I'm going to do terminal AI, site AI, edge AI, cloud AI, and basically try to find ways such as the data does not move from one layer to the other, but only the computing, and doing it in a smart manner. I think this way is not the right way. We're still wrong because if you go on that way, you're still trying to uh, let's say, adapt a network to a legacy network, which is a cellular. The question we need to ask ourselves is, is cellular still good for 6G? If your goal is not anymore basically to transmit data over your network, but to infer, because that's what we're doing. We're doing a super large scale computer here. We want to infer on what? We want to infer on the position of a user, for example. That's inference. You're trying to, to know what is the position of user. Is a cellular network the right way to do? And there, then you have to ask your question is, who came up with cellular? Well, if you go back to history and ask yourself, there's been paper showcasing that if you want to communicate from one point to another point where you have multi-users communicating, you cannot build basically a system of an ad hoc type, ad hoc networks, meaning just hopping. Because basically the interference will kill you and the system does not scale. So there's a bunch of paper that tells you that if you want to optimize capacity, but not inference, you have to go to cellular. In fact, the paper, what it said, these papers, what they say is that you need to clusterize basically your network into cluster. The users within the cluster communicate to cluster head. The cluster head communicates to the cluster head where the intended user is, and then you communicate like this. 
And this is exactly what we do in Seller. And this is the kind of question we need to ask ourselves. But since we're going very fast at the moment in terms of research, we're trying, just trying to adapt to the layout, which we know has been already deployed for many years, and trying basically to solve the problem on, on keeping basically AI at each point. I'll finish now with, the not, with, with an important thing is, of course, still the question of, of improving basically wireless. And the, we need to still improve wireless because the kind of data rate that we need is still huge. If you want to do a low portation, we're talking about 4.62 terabits per day. I mean, in terms of, of what you can do. In terms of, of, of cars, the data that they're putting with streaming cameras, we're talking about four terabits per day. It's quite huge. So we still need to find ways to push the Shannon limit. How can we do it? It's not easy. And here there are two, I would say, revolutions which happened these last years. The first revolution is that we learned that Shannon was not wrong, but the model that he's using is not the model that we use today. And if you look between the two pictures, one of the big difference is that now we have the capability to store the data whenever a communication is made. In fact, we don't store the data, we store the refined version of the data, which is called a model, because we learn, I mean, continuously based on the exchanges which are made. When you start basically, every time you're communicating, not starting your communication from scratch, but taking all the legacy of data that has been transmitted back and forth, you start building a, a, what we call a context between your, your intended transmitter and receiver. And when you build a context within an intended transmitter and receiver, next time you're asked to communicate, you will communicate differently because you know that your intended receiver has the same kind of model as you, and there are things you don't need to say. So this is a big change in the fact that we can exploit basically this kind of, of, a, of, of structure and model. So again, Shannon theory, is there and it's there forever. It's just a question of applying it to a model on which basically you have storage at each point and computing in each node. Second also paradigm which has changed is that in the model of Shannon, the, the, the channel was considered as an independent entity for the TX and RX. You had no influence on the channel. You could not change it. But suppose now you could change the channel as you would like. How? We're not going to talk about it. But if you could do that, then of course, basically your capacity would change because basically you would get into a better kind of channel, which of course would improve your uh, basic communication. And by the way, this is something we know. Whenever you don't hear well on your phone, what do you do? You start moving. And why do you move? Because you want to change the kind of environment. If you're in a lab in general, you put a fan to create scatterers because you want to change it. The big question that we had for so many years is that, was there a way to digitally, in a very simplified manner, change your environment? The last, I would say, 10 years have showcased that it's possible with a big revolution which has been made on things called metasurfaces and intelligent environments, where we are able to change the texture of your environment and make basically an environment which is more friendly or constructive within your communication. This is related to a big topic called large intelligent surfaces. This topic of large intelligent surfaces, what it does, it, it does basically a change of the properties of your surface so that whenever you transmit, when you had classical, what we call Snell's law of reflection, you can change those properties so that you can move the kind of beam forming that you did in another direction. A good example is a relay. By itself, a relay is not smart. However, if you could have smartness in terms of changing the direction where it goes, because you know where the intended receiver, then you can improve your communication link drastically. I will not have the time to talk about it because I think it has been already, uh, let's say, described uh, by one of my colleagues called George Alexander Poulos, but you can look at the plethora of papers looking at these things. And I think these two innovations are at the heart of big changes in the way we are pushing the boundaries, I would say, of the Shannon limit. The first one is that uh, the Shannon, the channel is not anymore basically a limit. You can push it very far, as much as you can, depending on basically these uh, kind of uh, smart surfaces. And second also basically is the fact that, as I told you, 
we are at the convergence of communication computing and the computing is changing the exact notion of what is basically transmitting a bit. Okay, I think I'll finish here. I gave you basically an overview of at the same time, the status of 5G, the roadmap of 6G, and what are basically at the moment, the key technologies which have a big potential to appear by 2030. Thank you, Professor Deborah, for that wonderful uh, session. And uh, just to clarify, uh, when you were uh, comparing Shannon 1.0 with Shannon 2.0, I think you were hinting more towards uh, context and semantics. If I'm, if I got that right. Yeah. So, so it's related to semantics, of course. The Shannon 2.0 is going to provide you what we call compression rate, and this is related to all the work which is being done in semantics. Yes. Okay. Uh, so we have. Uh, uh, I think three to four questions, and so I, I'll read it out for you. The first one goes as: uh, Could uh, could six G be the end of uh, wireless standardization, even from use case and technology saturation? So let's say that I'm not. So I'm I'm quite confident that there's not going to be saturation in terms of wireless because uh, there's always going to be new things which are going to be happening and. Uh, uh, Quantum is going to appear. It's going to have an impact and revolutionize also the way we we do com quantum communication with these kind of 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 of, of ways of of, of uh, combining the the qubits and stuff like that. So I don't think there is an issue there. However, the issue is: Are we still going to look in the same way that we've been building networks with this 10 years time frame every time frame? That can happen. Yes, meaning that uh, 2040 will now be a reproduction of the 10 years that you had between 2020 and 2030, and for various reasons, by the way. Okay. Uh, the second question is, uh, two, uh, many questions in the same one. It says, what kind of new waveforms, modulation, and frequency bands be used in 6G? Uh, there's a question mark, terahertz communication, there's a question mark. What about rate splitting, multiple access, question mark, and IRS, I think you touched upon IRS uh, towards the end anyway. Yeah, so so I gave a talk in ICC trying to, to express what I think are, are the major, basically, uh, uh, kind of, of challenges that we have at the physical layer, because these are mostly questions at the physical layer. So the first one, of course, is the waveform. In terms of waveform, I think we haven't tackled so much basically the question of how you do high mobility scenarios. And the high mobility scenario, this is a big question, OFDM breaks down. And second, of course, is also the fact that we are engaging into higher frequencies. So mobility and higher frequencies are two things for which we need new waveforms. For the high mobility scenario, the approach today is mostly based on a couple of papers related to Slapian of around the 70s looking basically at um, some kind of waveforms which have very good properties in terms of being a good functions of time varying channels that's what you want to do because uh, OFDM are good for time invariant channels that's why you use basically the cosine sign but when you look at the time variant then you look at what we call slate based stuff of course one subcategory of this huge category is a big trend today of using what they call otfs yeah. okay maybe you've heard of otfs this is part of that by the way if you look at, at the origins of OTFS, it's related to the Slavian approach. And so I think this is the kind of tackling that people will be approaching is to find basically uh, waveforms which are very good in very extreme time varying environments because we don't know how to tackle this. And we will have those issues. Why? Because you're talking about UAVs which are moving very fast, you need to communicate. These are going, are going to be going very fast and for which thing. The second is, also, of course, also the kind of properties that you have with higher frequencies. And for which the classical, I would say, multi-carrier or, or, or frequency selective type of channel would not make sense, okay? Uh, because you, you're thinking, so, so you need to combine these things. Um, and, and so I would say the gates are quite open on that. Second is, of course, the question of, 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 of multiple access. As you know, NOMA was not a success. <laughs> and, and everybody was pushing for NOMA. <laughs> <laughs> because basically, uh, well, it's normal. You have many devices and, and trying to find uh, the right approach to tackle NOMA. Uh, companies like Huawei were looking at, well, something called SCMA as an approach. Other companies are, were looking at rate splitting, other uh, things like that. So here, I think the, the it's quite open still on how to solve it, especially that 
one of the scenarios that we're looking is not anymore that we want uh, uh, more users with less rates. We want more users with higher rates. I told you about this uh, uplink centric things because we, we're going to have a huge number of cameras that we're going to be deployed and for which we need to solve these things. Uh, so in the same question, there was also uh, the mention of uh, modulation format. So in your opinion, uh, I've read in a couple of papers about OAM, the orbital angular momentum. I don't know if that is a success. What's your take on that? So that's a success, but in a very narrow scenario. So uh, OEM is mostly successful in the fixed axis. Okay, you need to have fixed axis and mostly millimeter wave. And the reason what we, it's not a gain in terms of capacity, it's mostly that if you're in millimeter wave and you have, for example, uh, a transmission which is related to bandwidth of six gigahertz, for example, okay, go from 60 to 65 or 70, then if you do DSP for that, it doesn't work. It's very complicated. And people have been showing with that using OEM or using what we call, in fact, OEM today is in a class of what we call massive modes. Because the idea is in general, you will solve Maxwell equations and there's many modes of transmissions. And as you know, it depends on how you solve them. It, when you solve, you solve them, usually people have been solving them by saying that uh, one, uh, I, will, I will basically parameterize my solution by being an exponential g omega t minus kr. But you have no reasons to do that. You see, I'm going to solve it for a given type of, 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 of a function. And then you have modes. And then the question was about demultiplexing those modes. And today we're able to do it. Here you have a gain in terms of complexity. Be careful. You're not going to change the capacity. The channel is a channel. That's it. It's a channel. You're not going to change it. But you have gains, for example, in your OEM. But the problem with OEM is that it's only good at the moment for fixed axis. So let's say it's more or less. Scenario based. Uh, we have one more here, and uh, this is from the secretary of the chapter, and it goes, uh, can you please comment uh, on metaverse uh, becomes reality in uh, R17 slash R18 itself, or we wait till 6G? Also for uh, terabits per second throughput, what do you think about bandwidth requirement considering 400 megahertz and 5G? Uh, uh, then uh, he mentions about LOS issues and hardware reality, the backward compatibility, feasibility in 60. So, because that's a lot of questions in one. <laughs> that is, the first yeah. one, metaverse is, is not something specifically for 6G, okay, or even for 5G. You could you could you could plug your head, <laughs> or plug your thing, and that's it. And that's what people are doing often, basically. Uh, they're, they're still doing plugs instead of doing wireless. But I'd say that, of course, it will just enable a much more richer experience, okay, if you have this completely mobile, no cable at all to do your things. You see a lot of people when you go in the booths in the CS Las Vegas, things like that, in general, they still have the thing there, but they have a cable here, you know, they still have the cable, in general, it's the fiber cable and going on. So, of course, uh, what wireless is going to bring is, of course, a more bigger experience where you're going to do it in stadiums, moving around, things like that. So it has nothing to do with 5G, 6G. However, for sure, the kind of, of bit rates that 5G is providing is not enough for doing this, this uh, full immersive experience. And the metaverse, of course, is providing much more than that, by the way. It's not providing just the fact that uh, you, you will help people to do something in the metaverse, but also you could use also all these metaverse IDs to start, you know, doing some kind of digital brain, things like that, which, you know, reproduces things in reality and going back and forth. So I think uh, uh, this metaverse is a very interesting approach. It is for us a killer application on many things. The business models are still not clear on how you do it. Then you had a series of questions, of course, about uh, release 17, release 18, how you do the backward compatibility. This is at the heart of standardization. This is the, why the process, by the way, is taking so much. Because when I said to the people, we're going to deploy it by 2030, but hey, guys, in two years, you cannot do any more research in 6G in the sense of uh, when I say you cannot do any more research, you cannot bring any disruptive ID. Of course, you will need to tweak and refine all the innovation which have been put on the table, but you cannot come up with something revolutionary because it will be too late. Okay. And so this is one of the reasons it's, it takes too long after is because whatever you come up with by 2024, we're going to spend a lot of time on the study items and all the items to be sure that we respond exactly to what you were saying, which are a lot of issues 
which are taken care in a very, I would say, detailed manner related to the backward compatibility, how things would work with this, what are the frequency bands which are optimal for that, things like that, for which at the moment we have no clue. So, for example, if I take lease and Reese, a lot of the application that we're seeing today is lease and Reese in a minimum to wait. And that's exactly. But again, uh, there are scenarios on which in the study item will be go, going deeper, understanding to which extent we can, of course, go in higher kind of scenarios in terms of frequencies or lower, which would make sense for that. And so if you ask me uh, in terms of what is the frequency bands, I think we're just at the heart because all the technology that we're mentioning are just like done in, in very specific scenarios and we're trying to expand them. And lease, for example, is a good example for that. I don't know if there was another question. Maybe it was in the chat. I don't know. Uh, I think we don't have any questions. Can you propose, uh, Dr. Ayer, for vote of things? If anyone uh, ask any questions, you can raise the hand also. Um. Yeah. I'm. I'm back. I had a small glitch. I hope. Yeah, I'm not hearing well, but it, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, hello, Amber, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, you are audible, but uh, I think Kishore, sir, is okay. Uh, I'm audible. Audible. okay. 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 Uh, Kishore, sir, can you repeat your question? You would like to because uh, it was not audible to uh, our resource person. Yeah, in fact, I, I haven't asked, but it's a wonderful talk and uh, fantastic. I would like to invite uh, the speaker of the day to collaborate uh, with the Bureau of Indian Standards, wherein one of the problem statements we have been uh, considering is the 5G to begin with. Of course, it uh, evolves to other uh, revisions like 6G, 7G. Uh, the use cases of 5G for the UEAV. Uh, this problem statement we are uh, addressing using the GSMA and the also GUTMA, that is a, a UTM association. And uh, we, we would like to also, because as you might be aware, India is now uh, contributing to the standard. ESDSI is also spearheading it. So we'd like uh, your TII's uh, contribution and uh, uh, through organizers, I'll get in touch with you, sir. And okay, we'll invite good. you to be part of the discussion in this uh, direction. Okay, with pleasure, uh, on the contrary. I'm involved in, 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 uh, in the WWRF, uh, we're organizing, by the way, a conference here in Abu Dhabi. So uh, I'll send you also the link. You're all invited, uh, taking place on, on questions related also to these problems of UAB, by the way, of, of coverage connected to rural areas. So that could be. And uh, as, as a general way of uh, complementing uh, UAE's uh, positive. And uh, as, as a general way of. Uh, UAE is very positive, I know, for knowledge uh, exchange, and I think uh, you, as you said, uh, it is transforming itself into a kind of a knowledge domain uh, nation from earlier energy-based. So I uh, I knew that the nation uh, provides a kind of 80% discount on a learning efforts. If you want to conduct an international event, government comes forward to offset your 80% cost, I came to know. Okay, very good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Ayer, you are not audible. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, we don't hear you. Yeah, I, sorry. Yeah, I, I had a glitch, so uh, sorry about that. Uh, so thank you very much, Professor Debba, for uh, thank the you. wonderful and very informative session. We are. I was really glad once you said, okay, that was the first shot. And they said, okay, it was just a pleasure. I've been following your research. So thank uh, you very much. There were, there were a lot of new things for me to, uh, you know, pitch in in my research as well. So thank you very much. Thank you for your time and thank you for the invitation. I hope next time we'll have the opportunity to see each other physically. I mean, with yeah, the, the yeah I, was, I was going to say that.
Yes, definitely. Okay, thanks again. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you. I know it's a bit late for all of you. I think it must be like 9.30 for me. Is, uh, is it done? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you. It's thank, you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. See you around. Bye. 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 Uh, yeah, I request all the participants to download your certificate and we are closing our meeting. I think, uh, Dr. Ayer, can I close now? I yeah, please, please. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Yeah, thank uh, you. Thank you to bring such a, such a uh, very high level, I can say. He's a very well known in. Uh, very, in yeah, yeah in that's general. what I was. I was uh, I, I would say surprised actually. The very first shot, and he uh, did say yes. I've attended a couple of his uh, earlier uh, talks, so uh, very down to earth and uh, all. Yeah, he is very share. kind and he is uh, very generous to support. Uh, these people always open to to give the talks and give the pathways, right. uh, yeah. the research areas where right. all. Yeah. yeah, it is good. It's a very nice interaction, and uh, right. yeah, it was indeed a, a very very useful talk. Right. Uh, all right. Okay. Okay. All right. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night.